towards the end of the alliterative more to Arthur. Arthur has the second of his two dreams in the poem, and unlike the first, in which he was assured by his seers of the validity of his claims against the Romans, in the second, Lady Fortune appears before him and tells him, although she has given him all his power, she must now take it away because he, like so many before him, has overreached himself with his own arrogance, vanity and pride. Let's read now from my translation and here we join the king as he tells his seers about his dream of Lady Fortune. Then this comely king, as the chronicles tell, bounds brightly to bed with a blithe heart. With slight he slackens his girdle and slings off his clothes, and through sloth of slumber falls into sleep. But one hour after midnight all his mood changed. In that early morning he met with a nightmare. And when his dire dream was drawn to an end, the king shudders with dread as if he should die. He sends for his sages and tells of his fears. In faith I was never so afraid since the day I was formed. Therefore readily read and interpret my visions, which I shall write and properly relate with the truth. I dreamt I was all alone, wandering in a wood, and I had no wit nor idea as to which way to go, for wolves and wild swine and wicked beasts walked in those wastes while seeking their quarry, and lions all loathsome licked their teeth, all from lapping the blood of my loyal knights. Through that forest I fled, where flowers grew high, from my feelings of fear of these foul things, and emerged in a meadow, encircled by mountains. Men may see no merrier place on all Middle Earth. These acres were encompassed and cast all about with clover and clearwort cladding the ground. The vale was environed with vines of silver, or with grapes of gold. None was ever greater, with arbours about it of all kind of trees, which herds grazed beneath in those high gardens. Every fruit could be found there which flourished on earth on those fine fecund boughs, finely hedging those fields. No damp raindrops fell here that should damage them. In the drought of the day all the flowers were dry. Then, down from the clouds, descends into that dale a duchess, dressed dearly with a diapered design on a surcoat of silk most splendidly hued, lined with pelts of otter all low down to the hems, and with ladylike lappets a yard in length. She was richly adorned with ribbons and gold, and brooches and bezants and many bright stones that embellished her back and her breast everywhere. Her caul and her coronet were so cleanly arrayed that such a comely complexion could not be recalled. She whirled with her white hands a wheel about her, and rotated that wheel as she would with great cunning. That round wheel was clad with red gold and royal stones, arrayed with great riches and plentiful rubies. The spokes were all splinted with spliced straps of silver, and a full spear in length spanned the space to the hub. On this was a chair of chalk white silver, chequered with choice gems of changing hues. Round its arc on the rim clung on kings in a row, with crowns of clear gold all cracked asunder. Six from that seat had been tossed in turn, and each sire said himself these words one by one, I well rue the day that I reigned and ruled, though never such a rich king did reign on earth. 
When I rode in my realm, I relished naught more than to hunt, ride, and revel, and hold folk for ransom. And thus did I spend my days in such deeds as these. Therefore, most deeply, I am truly damned. These great kings, these six kings, and there are two others, Charlemagne and Geoffrey de Bouillon, and a ninth King Arthur. These are the nine worthies. The poet explains to us later who all nine are. But the point is, Lady Fortune lifts those kings and Lady Fortune will drop them down. And so Arthur wakes from this dream. He tells his sages all that he's seen. And there's more in the dream which he talks about. He has lost. His sages tell him his time has come. Now he must prepare for his doom.